The views and opinions of the hosts and guests are their own and do not necessarily reflect the position of the management and staff of Guardian Network. The aftermath of every social revolution brings about change. Cultural norms and landmarks shift as our minds and hearts expand beyond the familiar. To everything, there is a season and a time to every purpose in the land of the living. This is our time to renew, revive, and restore the hope lost to the busyness of life. This is our time to dig again and rebuild from the storms of our past on a solid footing that holds. Welcome to The Foundation. The Foundation. ESC Distributors Limited, Grand Bahama News, Marcos Pizza, Prince Masters, and Ron's Electric Motors. The Foundation. The Foundation. The Foundation. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, 96.9 FM radio, Howard Grant in your company, The Foundation. It is a beautiful Wednesday afternoon, September 11th, September 11th, 2024. I know a lot of persons, um, uh, this is a hard day, Some um, maybe it's a decade and some ago, was it 2001, two decades ago? This was a hard day, I could never forget that. It's one of those days that you could remember, uh, I remember exactly where I was. When the towers fell. So I know that this is something that has happened more concentrated in America, but I believe based upon our proximity, it has affected the entire world or, you know, the Western world more specifically. And so we are commemorating that, identifying that I know a lot of you guys want to be able to talk about the debate last night. I did not watch it. Don't fight me. I didn't get an opportunity to be able to watch the thing last night. It's going to be there. I, I could watch it. I, <laughs> I'll watch it later on. Uh, guys, it's a beautiful day. Make sure you pick up your Guardian newspaper. All the information's in there. Shouts out to my good, decent people over at AFS Insurance Agents, Emma, and, and Insurance Agents and Brokers. They get everything laid out for you. Number 407 Blue Hill Road South. You can go down there and check them out. Talk to them. If you're in a market and you're looking for your, uh, your SDs, your taxis, your liveries to be insured, they do that in-house financing bulk um, um, uh, they can be able to do that for all your bulk vehicles. If you have those things laid out, they can assist you with that. So if you're looking for that, you don't want to break the bank, you want to be able to get your cars on the road, you want to make some things happen, ask for my good friend, Ethric Bo. They can assist you. 341-1AFS. That's 341-1AFS. They can assist you very well and uh, take you to where you want to go. They open 9 to 5 on the, day, on the weekdays, 9 to 2 on the weekend on Saturday, okay? Like I said, pick up the uh, the, the papers, uh, Wednesday papers right here, the campaign finance law, not a priority, which is bananas to me, which is crazy to me. Campaign finance law, not a priority. Prime Minister says that he's focused on issues that impact people. This is crazy to me. Anyway, so we're going to dive deeper into that. Check it out. So what and Sue's general manager quizzed over the financial disclosures and also both fractions of the Valley Boys to get seed funding. Uh, this is what Boleg says. Uh, I think that was OK. So I got a call. I got to give you a little piece of this before we get into our conversation for the day. I got a call from a very good friend of mine uh, right after we started to talk about this position um, on Monday. And uh, the Valley Boys position and the fractions that exist in there, we lent some suggestions and we thought it was easy peasy lemon squeezy, right? After this call, I realized the complexity and the egos that are tethered to an idea that has had no formality. Is that is that good for me to say it like that? I gotta be I gotta be decent. Egos that are tethered to an idea that never was rooted in formality, never was rooted in the proper ascension of how business is done in our in our country. And so when I see this, I realize that relationships get the better part of business. I just want to be decent as I look at this particular thing. 
And so the government has taken on this position to be able to hit, uh, to hit it like uh, King Solomon. Let me cut the baby in half. Let me cut the baby in half. <laughs> anyway, we could talk about that, right? So it says, now, uh, not critical of the government, uh, Pintard supposed uh, he supported the resolution for the Saudi fund loan. Uh, listen, I, I, I'm indifferent when I see some things because I believe that we should deal with some crowdfunding internally, identify how we could be able to create concepts and ideas to empower uh, local persons, and then externally, uh, if we are unable to do some things, then externally we can be able to pursue some stuff. But I don't know if they exhausted all avenues from the internal standpoint, because $55 million ain't seem like hard. It ain't seem like much that we, you know, we could be able to reach that. But anyway, let's have a good conversation, man. My very good friend is here with me. I haven't seen him in a little while. Last time we saw each other, was it in Heathrow? Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. It was some, it was some, yeah, some airport. Yes, some airport. True, yeah. We were talking in some airport, right? And uh, we were just having a kind of a quick conversation. I said, let's do something. I called him, and he wasn't here to be able to do some stuff with me. Uh, but he had some great representatives and sent down Stefan and sent down, uh, was it Vanessa? Vanessa. Was Vanessa. Right, yeah. Vanessa. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were phenomenal. We had a very good conversation talking about the sober series, Stay Sober Bahamas, right? Sober, uh, the sobriety series that we were talking about when I was on um, a leave for that two weeks, right? And so he's here with me, and I'm grateful to be able to have this kind of a conversation with you. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to be able to get the organization for responsible governance, none other than Matt Aubrey. Say good afternoon, my brother. Say good afternoon to all the people out there. Thank you. Thank you, Howard, and thank you to everyone today. Uh, this is a, a great opportunity, and, we, and we're, we were so uh, thankful to have the chance to talk a little bit about those concepts earlier in the summer. And uh, just to your credit, we got a lot of attention from it. A lot, of, lot of great comments, a lot of feedback, uh, the important and intentional process that you brought us through in terms of looking at how we unbundle some of that stuff. I'm glad and I'm happy that you're here because I think that this is, uh, and I was talking to some of the representatives and being able to say that I think that this conversation needs to be able to be carried on at least once a month that we can be able to find ourselves being able to sit down and dissect, uh, not necessarily from a condescending standpoint, not crucially, not trying to be able to dismantle what exists within governing, but lending, uh, you know, suggestions. The country needs to move in this direction, then identifying those things and providing the statistical data and information that exists, whether that's regionally or globally, to say that this is the course that we should chart. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes a lot of persons are kind of, uh, they're like ostriches. They get their head in the sand and only what they can see to the bridge of their nose is what they actually attempt. When, I think when I think a lot of us in our country are living in crisis, and and the conditions the conditions that we we are confronted with our economic, our social um, limitations, obstacles that we see, whether it be in the ease of ease and cost of doing business, the uh, accessing government resources and services as we should, when we should, um, even the even the cost of living is is out of whack, right? We're, our our cost of living is akin to London or or Manhattan. Salaries are not that. So so people are are working in circumstances that almost support the. I'm going to look at myself. I'm going to look at what's going on with the immediate things I can deal with, and outside of that, you can become disenchanted, disenfranchised, demoralized uh, based on on when you don't feel like a circumstance is going to reflect your interests or if you if your efforts would be doing anything meaningful to make a change. So so that stick your head in the sand becomes a response, maybe a very sound psychological response <laughs> to an environment that you don't feel you can do well, something about. It can be sound and psychological <laughs> to preserve your peace within, right? but not necessarily to the peace without in terms of the environment, in terms of uh, ensuring that all of us are moving in a particular direction. Right. And, and, at, and at the Organization for Responsible Governance, and you've given us this opportunity to talk about before, our real belief is that there are some immediate things that obviously people need to address, but we have to specifically also put attention to the long term. Yeah. We all need to invest in where we are going and what, what this world's going to be and what this country's going to be, particularly for our children. Has the crisis mode uh, eradicated that either from us? Has this kind of a crisis mode? I'd like to be able to, to talk about Maslow's hierarchy mm -hmm. of needs and how all of us are at this bottom tier just trying to be able to grab and grapple for survival. And so if we're in crisis mode, does that uh, eliminate this sort of an idea of looking at longevity? I don't. I think it makes it harder. I would say I don't think it eliminates it. I think there are always opportunities, and I mean, I would, I would hope that all those folks who go to church on a Sunday are thinking about longer term. They're not just thinking about right now. They're thinking about. But that term th is, that, that is skipping over that threshold it of eternity. Is, yeah. <laughs> they're looking at. They're skipping over Earth and getting to glory. <laughs> right. 
but there, there's a pathway that's got to hang out while you're still here, right? I like right? this. I like this, uh, man. I like this. So, man. so we, when we started eight years ago, our focus was almost exclusively on passage of laws, freedom of information, fiscal responsibility, uh, anti-corruption laws, things that we were really excited when we saw traction and we got those things passed. But we realized that those things, just like freedom of information that we was passed in 2017 and here in 2024, we still don't have the ability, Bahamians don't have the ability to get that information from, from government when they need it and when they want it. Um, we saw that without the active participation, a broader level of active participation of citizens, then you don't get the achievement of these laws and what ultimately the Westminster system and democracy is trying to uh, bring, bring about. So if we don't get citizens involved, then you not only don't get their oversight, which is a crucial and, and important process, making sure that there's accountability and that decision making is effective and that your interests are reflected. But you also, probably more importantly, you don't get the insight of our communities. Um, our communities, our folks that are that are struggling, they know what the problems are. They mm -hmm. also know what the solutions are. Mm -hmm. You sit and talk to folks. Um, we've done a lot of that over the last couple of years. We've gone to over 10 different islands and sat and talked with folks in the community and given them the opportunity, sometimes maybe the first opportunity they've had in a long time, to just identify what are the challenges that are keeping you and your, your, your community at a place where it's not moving to thriving. And it's, folks are amazingly insightful. Folks mm -hmm. are, are, are so crystal clear. They can give you examples and tell you what needs to happen. But their belief, their they trust it. that it's going to manifest or happen is, 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 the, is the biggest challenge. They live it. They live in this community on a day-to-day -day basis. They see in this sort of repetition, the cyclical nature of how these things happen. Mm -hmm. And they've identified that if we move this particular chess piece, if we move this element right here, this can't happen anymore. If we incorporate this, if we do this, right. and it seems as though that members of parliament and those persons who are given opportunities to be able to ascend to leadership in the country, uh, they are very, you know, articulate, insightful, and they show this sort of, uh, this empathy as they're on the campaign trail for these issues that exist in this particular space. But as they transition into a space of leadership, it seems like those issues become just like campaign finance reform, right. not a priority. Well, and I think that's that's so that's a critical point that you raise because the the presentation that it we can deal with things that are impacting people's lives, and then these other things don't really matter uh, is 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 not. I don't. I think we have to unbund. We have to look at that a little further because the reality is the conditions that folks are living in that are pro prohibiting their development come about because we don't have transparency, because we don't have mechanisms and systems in place that ensure both effective and, and accountable governance processes that, that reflect and are, are, are supported and understood by the citizens. The people who are most affected by policies should have a, a say-so, and the time they should have a say-so is early on in the development of that policy. If you create a solution and you don't really talk to folks, they're not going to own that. They're not going to buy into We've it. They might be very skepticism. And, and it happens all the time. We've seen this historically. Mm -hmm. uh, even when uh, government officials, despite their political uh, affiliation, even when they come to the forefront and say that we're going to be able to lend this uh, to public discourse, we're going to be able to have a conversation about this, we're going to have town meeting and so forth and so on, it feels like the decision has already been made. Right. And and I think that's why when we think about things like campaign finance, which which campaign finance brings uh, not only enhanced transparency, but there's that. It, it reinforces fair competition. It reinforces a public trust, a level of confidence that a system uh, will, will, will reflect your interest. We saw in the last election, which was a perfect storm, right? We had uh, coming out of COVID, you still had you know COVID conditions that were in the environment, and we had just adopted a new permanent registry. And the permanent registry, remember our old registration process, meant you had to go intentionally beforehand and say, I'm going to vote. So you reinforced that that behavior. People walked around with their thumbs and said, look, I'm going to vote. Look, you, you, you've already pre-committed. The current process, which is used in many different spaces, but it means you don't have to do that anymore. You're permanently on that registry. So the day of is the day you might decide, I'm going to vote or I'm not going to vote. And when we saw that uh, folks didn't come out in the numbers that they usually do based on the last, uh, last, um, last election, what we know is research says if you don't vote in one election, you're probably more likely to not vote in the second election. Yeah, because you, you've done it before. Right. And, and nothing, no catastrophic thing happened. Right. The sky didn't fall out. <laughs> and and or and or you didn't feel like your 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 input really would have mattered. 
if the person you liked got voted and you didn't vote, it goes really back matter. to what we said. Right. It feels like these things are already predetermined. Right. So the so so what we know is we're now in a in the silly season. I don't know if it's officially in the silly season or or getting into that. We know that the next election is crucial to get folks out to make sure that they are part of the process. You don't want a smaller and a smaller and a smaller group making decisions uh, on the voting levels. You want it to be a broad base. It seems like that's electorate. the trajectory. Well, it it ha we were we were in the low 90s, then I think high 80s, which was still pretty significant in terms of the percentage of electorate, um, and then this drop now down to mid 60s, which was the last one. So we know we have to work to ensure that those folks who felt maybe disenfranchised in the last snap election, which a lot of it was our youth voters, that they that their role and their vote does matter. We have to reinforce that. So something like campaign finance now, probably more than ever, is crucial because it's a mechanism to shed light and make sure that people understand the process, that they believe that their vote can matter, that their role of coming out and doing that thing that is so important in the Bahamian tradition of, 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 of casting that vote isn't disregarded as meaningless or someone else's responsibility. Mm -hmm. We have to show, and so systems like campaign finance, mechanisms like freedom of information, uh, uh, more, more robust and, and transparent processes around public disclosure, all of these things can be helpful to moving the electorate to a, a more active space, the citizens to more participatory roles. When you believe the system can reflect your interests, when you believe that it's not based on access, but it's based on uh, the, the, the common need and the greater good, you're more likely to be a part of that, that solution. I want to uh, take a break, guys. I want you to be able to join me in conversation. The line's going to be wide open for you. But before we do that, Matt, I want to be able to talk to you more specifically about something. I want to ask you this question before I go to a break. I want to ask you, uh, and not that I want to identify a individual or political organization, but I want to identify the system. Uh, it seems as though, it feels as though the system is designed. Mm. It's designed, right? Uh, not necessarily constructed, but uh, as a result of the culture and the acceptance and the shifting and the moving of these particular things, it is discouraging uh, the progressive voters, the potential voters, because if we look at the last election in mm -hmm. 2021, then we look at the by-election, we look at these right. particular numbers. Yep. There are persons that went out in West Grand Bahama who registered to vote mm -hmm. because it seems like it's sort of a coming of age mm -hmm. in our country. I, I'm, a, I'm an adult now, I can vote. Right. I'm an adult, I'm adult now, I have my driver's license, right? So this is sort of the coming of age, right? And as a result of that, you would think that all these persons that are registered in West Grand Bahama are going out to vote. They didn't show up. Mm -hmm. They registered and they still didn't show up. I'd like to talk about that. Right. What's happening? What is the disconnect that you found after going to all these islands and really being able to engage with the community over these years? What have you found is one of the things that causes people to be disenchanted with this sort of an eyes right. matter? Let's talk about that. Let me take this quick commercial break, ladies and gentlemen, and be right back after this. Important question. Foundation. Foundation. The foundation. The foundation. Tired of banks forcing you to use technology to bank the way they want you to? Your convenience is important. So no matter what your banking needs, Commonwealth Bank's friendly staff are always available in branch for that personal one-on-one -on -one service. But when you choose technology, our online and mobile banking app offers you state-of-the-art functionality. The choice is yours. Commonwealth Bank. Bank the way you want. Bonneville Bones, established in 1970, is the leader in men's fashion in the Bahamas. We're conveniently located in the Mall at Marathon Plaza and fully stocked with everything you need for all occasions. Our Harbor Bay location is one door north of Alive with the black and white signage of Bonneville Boutique. Both locations are open from 10 to 7 p.m. Monday through Saturday. Bonneville Bones and Bonneville Boutique, still the leader in men's fashion. Located in the Mall at Marathon and the Harbor Bay Shopping Plaza. Thomas, are you ready? Keep the Five Alive Music Group, along with our for sales, present the best of the best. Raking, scraping, explosion, reloading. This 
this is the biggest one-day old behemoth concert of the year. Featuring KB, D-Mac, Abby, Mama D, yeah. Fan Sean, Shine 242, The Falcons, and more. Mark your calendars. It's going down November the 2nd at Super Club Races Ground. Tickets now available at BahamasETickets.com or both Beauty Shack locations. Jamal admission, $60. VIP Skybox and Sky Ponds also available. For more info, call 394-0819 or email keep the vibe alive 242 at gmail.com experience the magic once again with more legends for one night only come party with us november 2nd and best of the best break and scrape explosion reloaded And we are back, ladies and gentlemen, 96.9 FM radio, Howard Grant and your company, The Foundation, here sitting with ORG, Matt Aubrey sitting with me, being able to have a very good conversation. The lines are going to be open, guys, if you want to participate in the conversation, I... I Y'all keep telling me, how would you say the numbers too fast? Okay, let me calm down. Uh, 323 622 323 That's a toll free number. Or just text me at 422-4796. Now, the reason I say it quickly is because I figure you got this. I figure it's in your speed dial in your phone, and you can hit me quickly. I only say it as a formality. Don't fight me. Let's talk about it. Matt, when we left off, we talked mm-hmm. about this, and I wanted to kind of know this, right? Uh, so many people are registered, right? Uh, we get the permanent registry now. We've identified those particular things. There's an expectation that uh, we can be able to, I don't know what the thinking was. Mm-hmm. Maybe we could cut down lines. Maybe we could be able to, uh, you know, cause persons to be able to move towards that. Maybe it was an incorporation of a COVID environment to ensure that people don't have to kind of congregate, but still have access to these particular things. So you got that. And persons didn't come out. Now, apologists had taken on this kind of position and look at the last general election, uh, 91, and indicate, oh, well, the environment was still rich with COVID. Mm-hmm. And this is why persons didn't come out. And then, boom, Obadiah Wilson passes away. They have a by-election in West Grand Bahama. Persons go out and register. Mm-hmm. They go out, get registered. The registration amplifies in that particular area, and they still don't show up to vote. And... and- one, we want to ensure and, and uh, uh, recognize the, the importance of folks taking and putting themselves out to make sure that they're registered. That is something that we cannot take in the next two years for granted. We have to make sure that at every opportunity. Um, we put together, uh, just to jump back to the 2021 election, we, uh, Stefan and a bunch of our volunteers, put together a, a toolkit on voting to explain the process, to let folks know, particularly geared for young voters. And when the SNAP election happened, it left folks who were still just learning about what this was in a situation that, well, I guess they really don't want my input and want my, 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 and that, so starting your experience as a voter or a potential voter off with something that really doesn't make you feel engaged uh, is a great, is not a great step. Well, similarly, if you go to the by-election, there was a lot of high level, we're on my side, your side, not a lot of discussion about issues, not a lot of uh, ability to sit and think and talk about what specifically X, Y, Z, because there was this national focus on, you know, my party, your party, and what that meant versus what are the direct needs of my community and have the people who've been talked about, do they have realistic opportunities to do something about that in my community? And so those types of scenarios are going to make folks not want to utilize their time, not put themselves in a position where they might feel there might be some recrimination, might not uh, feel that their time and their effort is, is as well spent as, as maybe doing something that might be more directly applicable to you and your family, your house, your community, or your neighborhood. That's a message that we really need to work hard against. The world has, stu- has struggled with this issue of public trust and public involvement across the world. Um, IDB two years ago did a study at the, uh, at, at the macro level looking at Latin American and Caribbean and found that public trust in government was the lowest in our region in the world. 
in the world, most of their research to, was looking at Spanish speaking countries. Unperceived corruption is the highest. <laughs> right. But, but when you, and I don't want to jump back to that, but when you, we, we, then we took it further and we did some studies, uh, some research going into the communities and, and uh, talking to folks about public trust. And well, don't you know, they said, yes, public trust in governments was very low. But so was public trust in not-for-profits. So was public trust in media. So was public trust in corporations, even the church. Folks are in a space right now where it is not an environment that supports your belief that the things around you all represent your interests, which goes back to our discussion about being in crisis. When you're in crisis, you're not making big, expansive, risk, risky type decisions. You're doing simple things that, that feel good, that, that you know are safe, that may take you out of opportunities that, that could be there, but you're, you're looking at things in a very risk aversive perspective, right? So I think that's a, an important thing to say that our, our region and specifically a lot of our country, particularly those in those family islands who don't feel like they're, they're consider, their interests are being considered at a pace and a time that meets the, the, the specific impact that they have. When folks don't have power and they don't have water and they don't have access to jobs and they, and they don't see themselves uh, uh, reflected in national dialogues or in national levels of investment, or they have to wait until something happens, they don't have banking features. These, and this isn't just this time administration, this, is, this has been going on for many administrations, but it does not breed expansive, community-based, nationalistic, national development type, they've coined type, a, a type phrase for it. thinking. They've coined a phrase for it in the family islands, they've coined this sort of a phrase that says, uh, Nassau centricity, right? right? They, right. They've indicated that everything is centered around what's happening in the government. There are a lot of persons here that have been living in Nassau for a long time. Right. And they struggle with the phenomenon of a lot of persons moving from the family islands to Nassau for an opportunity to be able to expand themselves. And I don't think that they give this into consideration that centrally everything happens here. If you want recognition, if you want opportunity, if you want access, if you want anything to happen, you need to be able to come to Nassau. Right. And I think that that's the environment that we've created. Do you think that from a political standpoint, from a governmental standpoint, that there can be, uh, they could divest themselves of uh, this autonomy, this strength, this power that's concentrated here in Nassau and distributed accordingly to the family of islands? I see that they're having a significant uh, sort of back and forth in Grand Bahama, and the government seeks to, for lack of a better term, being able to commandeer mm. whatever you know semblance of power that they had there and bring it back to Nassau again. Talk to me about this sort of an idea. So I, I think I think fundamentally, when we think about governance and the the, the process of it, we see it as a, a social contract between the citizens and government. There's a, it's a two way dynamic. There needs to be information coming from both sides. There needs to be listening happening from both sides. Decision making has to happen through a process that's reflected of both of those sides. And when, when citizens are not involved in that, then policies and situations that are developed are, are not going to hold and, and achieve what they ultimately are intending. So when we think about a, a decentralized Bahamas, because that's what we see and each community has got its own nuances and its own unique interests and its own opportunities, um, it, it has to be looked at through a different frame. So, so one of the things we've been working on, and, and I do, th I'm trying to not paint a negative perception because I think there's a lot of opportunity for change that's in front of us, um, is pushing forward and building the capacity of those folks in our communities, particularly those communities that don't tend to be uh, brought in very often, our marginalized communities, our youth, our women, our folks with disabilities, our family island communities, those groups that tend not to be in that process, we need to build up their capacity. Um, we not only do the benchmarking of laws and sharing information about laws upcoming, you'll see stuff on public disclosures and you'll see uh, stuff on campaign finance and you'll see a number of initiatives that come forward, but this work in the community, this engaging of the community is really about involvement. Our tagline is get informed and get involved and when that happens, then all of a sudden we have the opportunity where the public will can push the political will. And that mechanism is crucial. When it when happened before, it has. It's it, and that's the thing is we're not going. This is not something new in the Bahamas. No. It's a return to many things that have happened in many in many instances. Uh, but the mechanisms that we are in place have have moved that that to a, a less a less likely circumstance. Um, just as an example, we see that the last two administrations where we've had uh, and and governments have flipped 
you know, I think over the last four, five elections, and in the last two elections where there's been a super majority of folks from one party or the other, then those parties have taken, maybe as a way of ease of operation, but they've taken the majority of the, of the MPs in that governing party and brought them into cabinet in some role, in some form or fashion. So that means that when they are having the debates, the de very robust debates that are about what are we going to do, where are we going to go, what policies, how are we going to invest, what type of developments, those are happening behind closed doors in cabinet. And, and by the Westminster system, the closed doors in cabinet are obviously to drive and allow a freedom of discussion and debate that happens. But, but the mechanism is once it comes out and is on the House of Assembly floor, then most of the majority has to follow through and say what it, that is. And if you are in the constituency, it. well, I, what, let's, let's say the best of intention is they want to be able, they, they craft good ideas, those robust, fair discussions happen, and all of a sudden they say this is what's going to happen. But what it does as a, from what we're talking about is if I'm in the constituency and I've told my MP what I think or we've, we've had an effort in our constituency to say this is what we need to do, uh, I don't ever see that different represented in a debate. It, it, I'm going to see whatever government has now decided presented by... But this by debate, could have, the debate could have happened within the confines of cabinet, and, and, but you and will never know. You will never know. So the transparency, that, that, that debate, the, the, the intention of that debate is that citizens can see through the representative democracy that, that this is, that my interests are up there. And party, my MP is saying, hey, these are the interests of... Pinewood. These are the interests of Adelaide. These are the interests of, of South, and South Andrus or, or, or South Eleuthera. And, and then the discussion that happens reflects people looking at different sides, representing, and when it comes out, there's a lot greater likelihood I would bind and, and feel ownership for the decision. When, when we see the decisions being made in a majority being brought forward, and it's this administration and the last one, then we've lost a bit of opportunity to encourage citizens to make them see, hey, my words did make it up there. I did, I was considered, my perspective was considered. It may have happened in cabinet, but if they don't see it or have a feedback mechanism that reinforces that, then again, it reinforces in, in, your, in, your, uh, in your take a sit back kind of a mentality. I'm gonna sit back and see how this is sorted. Where what we also realize is that in that instance, then you need to make sure that there's very specific and regular and standardized mechanisms for public consultation that happen early enough for citizens to be involved, that happen in a wide enough stretch or through technology to make sure that folks in different spaces have a chance. And if that happens regularly, all of a sudden, you as a citizen, it's not just every once in a while something's going to happen. I get and see and can learn my I'm role. I'm updated. I have all the information. I understand my role. Mm -hmm. I can participate. There are polls that are giving out on a regular basis, whether that's from a con constituency standpoint, from a governmental standpoint. I can participate even if I don't see the representative in this particular space. I know that I have registered my thoughts, views, opinions in this particular space, it's being heard, and I expect something to be done. And in due so time. much can come from that, right? That's so heavy. much. We we do we actually uh, we where we have the resources. We are not for profit, so limited resources. But where we do, we try and create forums for that dialogue for government and the citizens to hear and talk to each other. Uh, there was a, a we partnered with the UN and the Ministry of Youth on a conference last Friday or last Thursday that was bringing youth and in, in, in hearing about the sustainable development goals and getting their perspective on some of the challenges. And when you listen to the youth, these are high schoolers and, and college students, they were so super articulate about what the issues were, what the solutions needed to be. Are they impressive? Oh my goodness. And so all of the solutions are sitting underneath it. We just need to kind of clear the space so we can marshal this incredible potential into future directions, future development, sustainable development. Well, what I want to talk with you with uh, over the course of the next hour and some is really being able to talk about some of the things that have been, uh, we've been grappling with socially. Uh, campaign finance reform, definitely you see that pop in the papers today. Mm -hmm. uh, so mm -hmm. an idea of being able to move towards a livable wage. We've seen uh, UB put some information out there, have that mm -hmm. information. And also the accountability in government, right? Uh, mm -hmm. We've been talking about that. We've been talking about uh, whether or not members of parliament have been able to declare mm -hmm. uh, their sort of position and whatnot. I want to talk to you about the Freedom of Information Act and find out uh, while it exists, a lot of persons are being able to take on the position that uh, it doesn't necessarily have the quote-unquote teeth mm -hmm. that we're hoping to be able to have it. And then support for independent candidates. Um, uh, those independent candidates, I don't know whether or not this is... Uh, 
throw it all away concept. This kind of a to hell with the formality of uh, of governments. To mm -hmm. hell with the formality of the traditional political organizations that are the two towers in the country and get the answers that comes from the constituency, the mm -hmm. answers from the people who've been really deliberating and mulling right. over this in their minds for a while. This is the representation of independence. Right. So I'd like to talk to you about those particular things. And I started off with this with this sort of an idea of a campaign finance reform. Mm -hmm. Tell me whether or not, uh, tell me what this could mean for the country, this idea of the framework, the idea of how this particular thing works and how this can work to for all persons. Because the prime minister, uh, he's indicated in his in his speech today and, and being able to take on this position, he says that he's, he's not focused on the issues that impact, he wants to focus on the issues that impacts people. Mm -hmm. Does campaign finance reform really impact the people? Talk to me about it. So when you, when you look at something, and let, let's also define our terms. Campaign finance law can be a lot of different things. Yeah. It can be it can be you know from from points of needing to disclose donor donor gifts of a certain level. It can be all donor gifts. Uh, there can be laws that support if you keep your uh, your fundraising to a certain amount, you can be matched. There's all kinds of different criteria that can come into it. Um, with have, also having very specific sanctions if you violate that or, or, or ways to, to reflect that. So, so I think the defined part of what campaign finance laws are in the Bahamas still needs to be crystallized and what that would look like. But, but in, the, in the broadest terms, campaign finance laws bring enhanced transparency. Um, they uh, allow funding sources to be disclosed. They make sure that there's a more transparent and accountable political environment so that folks have a better uh, ca capacity to make a decision about who you want to give that very important vote to. Um, it inserts fair competition and a level playing field, um, which reinforces our equity and our inclus inclusivity in the process. If a system can be co-opted by a very small few that have the resources, then there's a great likelihood that when decisions are made that those things will influence those decisions. And even if it doesn't happen, the skepticism or the perception that it does can also taint the process. And perception is reality. Well, and that's the other thing, too, when we talk about corruption, right? So, so campaign finance can also obviously have an impact on reducing corruption. In the Bahamas, I think what we see is there's also an equal challenge to the perception of corruption. Things may be above board. We have a lot of things at play, work groups that are working in these spaces. And so it's very likely that we've had some gains on this, but the general perception is that it's just as bad as it's ever been. Mm -hmm. And when you have mechanisms and laws that ensure that these things are very clear and transparent, it puts it, it dispels what what is maybe perception, and it solidifies on where the real issues might be that still need to be addressed. Um, it increases voter engagement, which is, we've talked about, crucially an important process. Uh, that, that civic en engagement and that participation strengthens our elections, it strengthens our democracy, it creates the sustainability of government decision making where it becomes more effective and more efficient. Um, and it ultimately drives a level of, of economic fairness. When, when I don't believe when I believe it's a pay-to-play environment, I'm not going to take my small business and invest and try and make it into a, a mid-sized business. I'm not going to take my formal, my informal businesses, which it's been estimated maybe as much as 20 to 30 percent of our economy is little side gigs that don't have a business license, don't have a this, don't have a that. I'm not going to move further on that or take a shot at making it formal or trying to put myself out and put a real shingle out if I don't believe that I'm going to get the same opportunities because I'm not either part of party A or party B or I don't know somebody. And, and the perception of that, again, is something that keeps us, that holds us back maybe even more so, so than the actual practice of it. We know that particularly this is an issue for those informal businesses. When we get like hurricanes, they are the ones that suffer the most. They lose everything. And in many instances, that's the critical thing that keeps them off of the social services role, or that's the thing that allows them to take care of their family. They got that side business of baking or doing hair or doing car repair or whatever that might be. But when something happens and takes that away, you can't restore it because you don't have a footprint, you don't have a business license, you can't apply for loans, you can't get the grants that might come from disaster relief, those types of things. So all of that does make a difference in your day to day. This law isn't a silver bullet, but it sets conditions that make folks see a benefit in their daily life and an opportunity to move towards thriving, not just existing. I like that. I like this sort of an idea to talk about these things uh, and being able to talk about campaign finance reform. 
I think um, I think it ties in with the the independence also. I have a desire to be able to move towards independence. I have a desire to be able to represent from an independent standpoint. I have a desire to be able to talk about these things. And as a result of that, I have to be able to figure out uh, how many. And I want to make it as basic as possible uh, based upon what we've seen campaigns to represent. Mm -hmm. How many shirts can I purchase? Mm -hmm. Right? These guys are going to out shirt right. me. Right? <laughs> how, many, how many posters can I buy? Mm -hmm. How I don't want to be swallowed up by an opportunity by being able to do these things. How do I put myself on a level playing field? How do we shift this idea that it's all about the perceived idea of money mm -hmm. being funneled or, you know, uh, a wash in the constituency as opposed to being able to identify the real true issues? And I think that's, that's important. Right. And that's that social contract we talk about because it's a, it, there's a responsibility on both sides, right? We also need to work in our communities to make sure that as people are making decisions, they're making decisions based on longer term gains, not immediate ones. Yeah. What are the things? Long term. Okay, yeah, sorry about that. Um, well, I want to take a quick commercial break, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we're going to be able to talk about it. Uh, quick commercial break, get right back. We're here with none other than Matt Aubrey being able to talk the way that we're talking. Be right back after this. Sorry about The foundation. Tired of banks forcing you to use technology to bank the way they want you to? Your convenience is important. So no matter what your banking needs, Commonwealth Bank's friendly staff are always available in branch for that personal one-on-one -on -one service. But when you choose technology, our online and mobile banking app offers you state-of-the-art functionality. The choice is yours. Commonwealth Bank. Bank the way you want. Bonneville Bones, established in 1970, is the leader in men's fashion in the Bahamas. We're conveniently located in the Mall at Marathon and the Harbor Bay Shopping Plaza, and fully stocked with everything you need for all occasions. Our Harbor Bay location is one door north of Alive, with the black and white signage of Bonneville Boutique. Both locations are open from 10 to 7 p.m., Monday through Saturday. Bonneville Bones and Bonneville Boutique Still the leader in men's fashion. Located in the Mall at Marathon and the Harbor Bay Shopping Plaza. Bahamas, are you ready? Keep the Vibe Alive Music Group along with our for sales present. The best of the best. Raking, straight, explosion, reloaded. This is the biggest one-day all Bahamian concert of the year. Featuring KB, D-Mac, Avi, Mama D, Fine Sean, Shine 242, The Falcons, and more. Mark your calendars. It's going down November the 2nd at Super Club Breezes Group. Tickets now available at BahamasETickets.com or both Beauty Shack locations. General admission $60, VIP Skybox and Sky Pods also available. For more info, call 394-0819 or email Keep the Vibe Alive 242 at gmail.com. Experience the magic once again with more legends for one night only. Come party with us November 2nd and best of the best. Break and scrape explosion. For fast, reliable, and impactful printing services, look no further. Let Printmasters bring your masterpiece to life. We stand by our quality products that is second to none. Our affordable pricing and friendly, efficient staff makes Printmasters the ultimate choice for all your printing needs. We can deliver any type of printing services, from banners to booklets to business cards. You name it, we can print it. Let Printmasters bring your masterpiece to life. Located in the Nassau Guardian Building, telephone 302-2361. It's time to upgrade the way you enjoy at-home entertainment. Alive Fiber is here. Enjoy all your favorite channels and streaming apps, all at lightning fast internet speeds with affordable bundles. And it's only a click away. Visit www.alivefiber.com to sign up now. Stay connected, live your life. It's good to be alive. When you jump in your Japanese import and you turn the radio on, all you hear is... For the month of September, the HitSpot will install a band extender in your Japanese import for the discounted rate of only $79.99, that included. Get your band expander installed today at the HitSpot and listen to Star 106.5. Plus, get fresh news and smart talk on Guardian Radio 96.9 FM, Nassau, Bahamas. <laughs> 
And we are back, ladies and gentlemen, 96.9 FM radio, Howard Grant and your company. I'm hoping that you're enjoying the conversation. I'm sitting here with none other than Matt Aubrey, all the way from ORG, being able to talk to us about a great deal of things. We put on the table campaign finance reform. You broke that thing down and being able to dissect that and understand our position and being able to bring clarity in those areas. Matt, you started to talk about that. Let's talk about this before we get out of here, if we have enough time. Uh, set the parameters and the foundation for this concept and idea of a living wage. Now, mm-hmm. I looked at I looked at the layout that came from UB, right? I think it was done in 2021. They made modifications to it. I looked at the layout, and uh, as I identify that, they have, they've set up the Bahamas in different jurisdictions, mm-hmm. right? So Grand Bahama is a higher living wage in comparison to Nassau, in comparison to Abaco, right? And so it's broken down like this, and I'm asking myself, this is peculiar. Now, when you look at the United States of America, uh, there is uh, a national minimum wage. However, certain cities, such as New York, right, such as California, California, it yeah. costs you more to live there, yeah. and they're making more money there. Mm-hmm. So it's, as a state rule, laws and leg- uh, regis- um, uh, legislation that govern this particular jurisdiction, mm-hmm. you have to get paid more. And, and it's really interesting, particularly California, when you look at it, just to jump off that, so California has really elevated their minimum wage, yeah. $20, $20 yeah. minimum wage, which means that if you have a job, that job should be... They made $20 billion in 2021 or 2020 right. from medicinal cannabis, $20 right. billion. But they also have record numbers of homeless. Record numbers? I mean, if you go to LA, it's 100,000 plus they people that are on the streets. City. Yeah. I, I went, we went to LA for the Summit of the Americas, and this would have been two years ago. And it was just amazing, the volume and the challenges and the things. And it speaks to the fact that that in and of itself doesn't bring up everybody. Was it L.A.? We saw each- I was in L.A. Was it? It might have, it might have been that. Yeah, I was in L.A. Been, yeah, last yeah. year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, that, so that, that wave of one thing that's going to fix it, unfortunately, usually doesn't manifest. So the call that we need to continue to invest in our local economy is crucial. That was the lesson that came out of COVID. If we had a, a more sustainable local economy, then the influence when tourism is interrupted by a natural disaster or in the case of the pandemic, we're going to be better off. We're going to be circulating money That's more crazy. within our communities. There's, there's a better That's reliance. Crazy. We have the ability to come back and manage our own selves. We're always still going to be struggling on That's a lot crazy. of the issues of import. But when you have businesses that are thriving and locally driving us, more local workforce, a lot of great things that happen to that. And so obviously there's an important goal in terms of bringing those salaries to a point where they do sustain in our environment where things cost as much as L.A. or <laughs> London or, 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 or New York. Um, but it has to be met with other pieces in place as well. We need to be working on issues of literacy and numeracy. We Talk need to the me. issue of so, 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 the, the soft skills, right? We, we did a number of bit of work with the, it was a great conglomeration of the uh, Department of Labor, a lot of not-for-profits, a lot of private sector folks, um, groups that are in training settings like the NTA or LGM uh, Academy. And we really looked and talked a lot about what does, what is the, the what's the solution here? Because it, it, we, it it's so critical. And what we saw is that we're still struggling to have an input in our primary developmental tool, which is our education system, our primary and secondary education system. So a lot is happening afterwards. And all of a sudden, we've got folks who are struggling. And that point of uh, what we'll see now with any discussion of increase of wage is the, the businesses who still seem to feel like they're struggling say, we can't handle paying more. And if we have to pay more, that's mean we're going to hire less. And if we're investing in a workforce that is going to blossom our economy, they need to be built from ground up. And so we, so we have to have a push at this point of what UB is talking about, increasing and pushing the threshold for what people can live at and make in in both 
outside and internal to the private sector. I mean, and, I mean, and but the there should be sector. reciprocity here. There should be value. But then there's, there, we should be a focus on on effectiveness, on quality, on 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 benchmarks that that achieve and fly and foster that. A lot of the term they talk about is upskilling. And that's an easy thing to say, but the truth is, if we can invest it in sounds catchy. provide, right? It's a great, it's a great T-shirt, right? But <laughs> but we we need to see that that manifests in we're giving folks skills where they can use those opportunities. We're creating jobs that are not terminal. We're creating jobs that lead to growth and development, and then ultimately yeah. sparking new businesses. So the so the coordination around any of these things is critical. So we did a public service report, uh, public sector reform report last year with. Dr. Uh, Pintard Nuri, and we put forward a lot of these things that potentially could start to move and govern the government in a way where the coordination of those resources is. is well, I got to take a, a quick break. Uh, Matt's going to stay here with us, guys. The lines are going to be wide open. I love you to guys that participate. I see your text coming through. I'm going to read those texts on the other side. Quick break. Get to news and be right back after this. <laughs> The foundation. The foundation. The foundation. This is Godwin Radio, ninety-six point nine FM, Nassau, Bahamas. Guardian Radio, your station for up-to-the-minute news, intelligent, interactive, and engaging conversation. 96.9 FM. I'm Lennox Sands. And I'm Debbie Deal. And you know us from the Contractors Association. We're excited to talk about our new show coming to Guardian Radio called Nailed It. We are going to be on Thursday nights between 6.30 and 7.30. So we are very happy to invite everyone to listen into to our shows as we talk about construction, design-related things also. If you are a subcontractor, if you're planning on building a home or renovating, you need to be a part of this show and tune in. Nailed It. Premiering Thursday night at 6.30 p.m. right here on Guardian Radio 96.9. You've asked for it, and so I am back. Kendony Campbell-Moss with Kenny's Corner. Let's talk about everything that makes your heart jump and makes you want to tingle. The radios are going to be set an absolute blaze. Tuesday, 6.30, Guardian Radio 96.9 FM. Kenny's Corner, ladies and gentlemen, Guardian Radio 96.9 FM. Fresh news, smart talk, all day, Tuesdays at 6.30. Right here in sunny Bahamas at Guardian Radio 96.9 FM, you will want to tune in every Sunday, 5 p.m. to 6.30 p.m. Starting September 15th, I, Garth Minard Roseboro, will bring you a program where your opinions... Meet the facts, where fiction meets reality. I welcome you, September 15th, Guardian Radio, for Remark, 96.9 FM, Bahamas. So much things to say right now. They got so much things to say. Come and join us every Wednesday night from 7.30 to 9 o'clock at Guardian Radio 96.9. Voices of the Diaspora presents two shows, Straight Talk and People's Voice, with Robertson Gironi and Aved J. Exume. We educate, inform, and transform. Be sure to listen to Voices of the Diaspora from 7.30 to 9 p.m. every Wednesday on Guardian Radio 96.9 FM. This is Guardian Radio 96.9 FM. Fresh news, smart talk. The foundation. 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 Foundation. The foundation. The foundation. 
And we are back, ladies and gentlemen, 96.9 FM Radio. Howard Grant in your company, the foundation, live and in full effect on this beautiful Wednesday. Having great conversation. I'm enjoying it thoroughly as we dive deeper into some of the mechanisms that we're using in government to get to a place of productivity and growth. I feel like for a long time we've been stagnant. And if we don't identify the element, that proverbial block that's keeping us from being able to see that kinetic movement, towards the space and the place that we can be able to, you know, contently, all of us say, okay, well, at least we move on. At least we can see some things happen. I feel like there is a sort of a wall that exists between us, between the government being able to say that almost 10 million people have come to the Bahamas, and then simultaneously we could be able to see the taxi drivers and the livery drivers being able to go at it. Uh, it seems as though that there isn't enough for everybody else. What's happening here? What's happening? Why is this information lost in translation as it comes to the community? We got to figure this out. And so I'm sitting here with Matt Aubrey, ladies and gentlemen, and I want to be able to introduce you, Matt. Uh, when we left off, we had good conversations about uh, minimum wage or wage increase or livable wage and being able to find those things. Talk to me about this. So I, I think, again, the, 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 the collective work is, is critical, and it's easy to say and not easy to do. I think um, we often talk about it, because you're right, we, we used to do a lot of these things in the Bahamas. There was a lot more civic engagement. I mean, what led to independence and beyond, there were lots of those instances where you saw folks coming together, Even working after together, that, you know that. Right, working, working towards benefiting uh, your community and the growth of a new nation. But those things have fallen a bit. So it's kind of, I, I, I always equate it to, it's like you, you used to be in really good shape and then you stopped kind of exercising. You stopped going to the gym. Right. And if you go back to the gym and you try and lift too much. You hurt yourself. You're going to hurt yourself and you're you not going to go back. You remember your last spot. Right. Man, listen to me. I can lift three plates. <laughs> right. Easy. Right. 345 <laughs> plates. I can hit that. You go to the gym. You can break right. your ribs. <laughs> so, so we have to think about when we're moving towards these things and again they're, they're, they're important to, to crystallize collaboration is something we say but it, it needs specific skills and a thought process and and we actually we does actually it need a mediator it, it doesn't always need a mediator but it needs uh, it needs common language and it needs a common purpose so often you pair with somebody or some group or some initiative when there's a crisis when hurricanes happen we all mobilize and those first two weeks are amazing you see the full potential of the bahamas coming out helping their fellow man yeah. doing what needs to happen the reinforced conversation right. about resilience absolutely yeah. and then two weeks after as it goes things start to break apart a bit and there's people no go back to their silos and they go back to their areas and they go back to the status quo of this is how we get things and all the same challenges and of, the rubble exists in right. those particular spaces they right. never they never complete a task right so in working on this, if we're going to sustain it, if we're going to build a new paradigm, if we're going to build a new set of skills or re build up, get back to those skills that we might have had in past, it has to be deliberate and it has to be safe and it has to be meaningful. So when we, when we think about in, in our work very tangibly, we're going into communities and we're talking to folks about the challenges that they are uh, incurring, but we're not coming as a list to say, great, now org's going to go represent you in the solution of this. No, it's more how do we equip you and build your capacity to address these issues as a community? How do you start on community issues, then move to island issues, then move to national issues? That process has to be supported. It has to be deliberate. It has to be reinforced. If you don't, if it's a, if it's a terrible, like you say, going back to the gym and the first time you try and lift, you're not going back to that gym. So we have to be very, very, uh, very specific about what we do. Um, we have tools on our website called the Policy Review Center where you can go and you can look at the new laws that are coming forward. Is it org.com? Org.bahamas.com. Well, org.bahamas.com. Um, and in uh, doing so, uh, we hope people will read the laws. We also have a mechanism where you can put your thoughts, your criticisms, your supportive comments, your you know new ideas, and we will share it just as you wrote it, as long as it's not profane, to government and the opposition, and then make it available publicly. Do you get acknowledgment that they've read it? Uh, or so, received it? Yeah, that would be the that would be the, the expectation. However, I will say that feature is not used that often. It's usually used by people who are really angry with government or in the Today. middle of that, right? So you just get to the and and we need to support the use of something like that so that people regularly are arming themselves with what are the types of laws and passed. 
Now, the, the social contract of the two-way is we also need government to give us that information as early as possible. We need government to create meaningful spaces when plans are being developed, policies are being developed, so that citizens can hear about it, not the week before it's being tabled or debated. Not, before, not in, a, in, a, in a situation where uh, a development's about to happen and you just heard about yeah, it. Yeah, because you've already made the decision. Right. You've discussed it in cabinet within the confines of those particular things. You've made the decision. Now, the proper thing for formal purposes is to introduce it to the public sphere. Right. Right? No, nah, but you didn't make your decision. Right. <laughs> you left me out of this. So the process of that just can can either re reinforce that, wow, I'm really glad that I participated because I, I feel like my role was meaningful and I see, can see some results or at least hear what happened when that happened. I can see even an acknowledgement it of an email or a letter, right? That's important. But if you don't, it goes the other way, right? Yeah, because guess what? Uh, at the end of the day, people feel like their only time that their voice really matters is during election time. Right. And if you're going to wait until election time to be able to hear my one voice, uh, my one vote as a voice, mm -hmm. then, you know, maybe I don't even need to talk. And I think that that's is sort of the disenchanting concept. Right. Why people disengage in that particular area. I wanted to ask you a question also, mm -hmm. though. Um over the past eight years and your participation in identifying these things, I know that you've had significant conversations of how we could be able to make modifications. Uh, you looked at strategic elements that can be able to kind of alleviate uh, this kind of a bottleneck. Yeah. So you want the free flowing stuff, right? And so you try to chip away at the edge and try to introduce a concept here, an idea here, legislation here, advocacy in these particular areas. Uh, talk to me about a ministry. Do you believe that there should be an additional ministry? I know that we have a plethora of ministries that exist in this space, but at a, a ministry, do you believe that there should be one that can help with this sort of a transition? The last administration, uh, uh, Dr. Minnis, he did, in my view, uh, he kind of etched towards being able to give a level of transparency at the onset when he started to give us the uh, the secretary, right? Mm -hmm. The they, was the, that the the uh, there was a well, there's two parts but the basically the deliverables unit the right. delivery unit delivery right unit. so yeah, he yeah, created yeah. the delivery unit right and so he created this kind of a space and I said okay this is this is cool mm -hmm. it didn't work the way that he expected it to do right and I don't know whether or not it was active the way that they were supposed to mm -hmm. be right so, so we're looking for some things to happen and and we uh, we had been involved to some degree with some of those folks um, and still have some some in, input and some direction with some of the folks that come out of the office of the prime minister in these spaces and the concept is one that is sound in many ways um, there's something called deliverology right that, that comes out of the UK that was that model to say that all the ministries that are doing their things are challenged and working in their own spaces with their own you know, unique issues and opportunities, but that from some central space, there should be a, a group that's following and tracking the progress in those areas and, and problem solving when challenges come forward, helping to support collaboration. So in, in, in a concept, absolutely. Absolutely the process of helping ministries to better communicate, to, to better share resources is crucial. And, and the benefit of is obvious as well. If the folks we're serving and supporting, often they fall across a number of different ministries. They might be have a touch point with the Ministry of Education and the Ministry of Social Services. They might be through the Ministry of Youth. And the fact that those three experiences might be very, very different, good or bad, uh, tells something. Whereas it's the same person. We, we you know we're trying to grow people. We're trying to help people to develop and thrive. And creating spaces, gaps that challenge accessibility, even even in small ways, can can absolutely inhibit the kind of work and, and growth that needs to happen. So a, a collective uh, approach to say how are all these things working together is a very important process. Um, in our own instance, we 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 had an anti-corruption conference a couple of years ago. And it wasn't the type of conference that comes together and says, this is how terrible corruption is and what it does and all the destruction. It was actually gathering all those folks in, in private sector, public sector, media, um, uh, academia, who are working to improve conditions related to anti-corruption and integrity in governance. And we came together and we had a really honest and candid discussion around what that would look like. And through that, we developed a framework that showed, wow, these are all the ways that these things work. And developing a, a framework like that is crucial because it helps people to track their work against others, identify where potential partnerships might be. Well, don't you know, in a bigger scale, we have such a document here in the Bahamas. It's called the National Development Plan. 
the National Development Plan and Dr. Virgil Roll and her team two or three administrations ago did some phenomenal work. Which uh, Gowan continues to talk about. Uh, Gowan talks about it. The Felix Stubb talks about it. Dr. Hamilton from Civil Society behind us talks about it. We talk about it. It is something that we all believe in. And if you look at that document, which is, is, a, is a stiff read, it's 400 pages, but all the issues and solutions that we tend to come back to and come up with, they're there. And, and better than, than anything, it's been reflected and tracked on things that we were already developing in plans. Keva, <coughs> Keva Bethel's notes on education plan is, is, is reflected in there. Some of the island plans are, are reflected in there, a push towards renewables, a push towards youth development, a push towards gender equity. They're all there. And they've been tied into not only our own national indicators, but they've been linked to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So the, the really interesting trick of that would be if we were working and following that plan, we would not only be meeting our own internal national obligations, but we would be satisfying and, and contributing to the international obligations we've already made. Mm -hmm. And that document has been sitting as, as a resource, a number of parts of government have borrowed from it. Some groups like ours have borrowed from it. But it's not until it's brought forward in its full force that we can see the benefits that come from this collaborative approach that you talk about. So a you secretariat of that, of that magnitude could be very effective. You think it'll happen within, OK, so, so I view this. Uh, I view this in the light of a conversation about behemonization, mm -hmm. OK? I view this, uh, there was a relentless conversation that happened to say that they're going to give opportunities as we transition and found ourselves in the independent sovereign space. Uh, we're going to give opportunities, persons are going to come down, they're going to train us, it goes right back to the light soft skills and being able to prepare persons mm -hmm. to be able to find themselves in this position. And after they've done all those things, then we get to formally have these jobs. In theory, this concept was great. Right. Politically and actual practical application never happened. Mm -hmm. It never happened. Now, there are men out here listening to me right now would say, well, Howard, that's not so. It happened. Not so. Not from official standpoint, not for a rollout standpoint, not to ensure that we had all these things. I did an entire study on behemonization. Mm -hmm. And the only persons who talk about it ad nauseum is uh, Frankie Wilson. Mm. That's the only person who I could be able to say on paper that I've identified. Everyone makes mention of it, mm -hmm. but there's no formality associated with right. that. That's not happening here with the NDP. However, it's falling into this kind of a la-la land. Mm -hmm. Instead of an idea where we could grab a little piece from it, I know that this is good, but there's no one to enforce this right. for the transition and transformation of our community. And and more and more when you'll see things like that, as you, you're right, there's a crowd and, and a, a group that does know about this and they're aware of it. And they, and they see it, and they may even contribute to it, or as you say, they utilize it as a guide for their own direction. Um, and that's still important. That means that has a, that did have a, an effect. There still it is some, some ongoing benefits. But with the National Development Plan, um, we saw two or three weeks ago, I think around the same time you were doing, you were doing your, uh, sober, your sober thing, yeah. that there was a meeting that the IDB put together that brought a number of stakeholders together. And they initially thought it was going to be a smaller group, and it was oversubscribed. The room was packed. People wanted to be in that room. People had an investment and a belief in the National Development Plan. People from government, people from the private sector, from the civil society sector, from the religious groups. People were there and believed in this, the necessity of this thing. How do we get it? Dave? So there's the challenge. If all of us see this as a solution, all of us get that education needs to change, all of us get that we need to have a better economic model and, and electricity and, and energy and the cost and the ease of doing business should be better. What's keeping us from moving forward if we all see the problem? And the challenge is the systems don't support this, this collaborative approach. Our, our, own, our own mindsets and our own skill sets have, have yet Culture, have fallen away. Culture, tribalism. So we have to think about how we move past that and not move past that in the model of somebody else did it once, but what is the Bahamian version of this? What does it look like? What are small groups that are located in communities that we know and believe talking about how do we create and move that move move that energy and those those results and those thoughts in a place where it becomes a little bit more formalized where we have spaces where folks are listening the the simple answer which is what we're working towards is is i think twofold i think it's leveraging and building the strengths of our citizens to be their own advocates to be community based groups that are talking about and moving forward with common issues that, that make sense for them and creating spaces. So the simplicity of 
writing a letter to your minister, your member of parliament, you know, sending an email, going visiting a, a, a constituency office with a group of, of, your, of your neighbors and talking about a common issue, being able to bring it forward. We do a lot of we do a lot of sending things on WhatsApp. We do a lot of things, sharing things on social media. We do, we call into radio shows and these are all important ways for us to express our ideas. But when those things happen in these spaces, how are they being mobilized? How do we bring those together so that they become a common voice, something that could be used to support the movement of the political will based on a, on a, on a public political interest? Political organizations having, uh, the, okay, so individuals, uh, from a governmental standpoint, individuals who ascend to government and uh, those who seek representation in their constituency make mention of it. They may have it wrapped up somewhere big to wait in their conversation. If you are if you are uh, astute enough and you know exactly what's what, you can say, oh, I know this information came from the NDP. Oh, I know this information came from the NDP. But as it relates to political organizations being able to, imp to identify and articulate they say that we are going to be able to execute these particular things. Now, we've read the entire NDP, and as a result of reading the NDP, we have baked into what our expectations are in our manifesto that we're going to execute X amount of things. Boom, boom, boom. We haven't seen that. And, and part of that is because, as a country, we're only fighting with one arm. The one arm is government. The reality is uh, a successful democracy tends to have input from a, a, a government, a strong and vibrant private sector, that brings innovation, drives workforce, moves the economy, and a strong and vibrant third sector, the not-for-profit sector. The one that makes sure that voices that aren't typically heard are in the mix. The one that makes sure that what government said it was going to do it may, it is going to happen. The one that makes sure that as, as businesses are operating, they're not doing so at the sacrifice of our environment or our people or our communities. That three tripartite model, as, as, uh, as my good friend Dr. Hamilton talks about, is crucial because not only do those three benefit each other, but they also put each other in check to some degree. And, and that means that what comes forward is, is all of our engines firing on, on the same, or all of our pistons firing um, in, in that engine. Um, we Similar have it, to legislative, executive, executive, and the judiciary. Judicial, right? Those that, that triumvirate helps to make sure that yeah. those pieces work in place. When an executive is overly but powerful, that's a principle, you know. then you're not getting those those the benefit of those other parts, right? The trifecta shows us, from a principle standpoint, that it works. We've seen the trifecta exist within the core of uh, organizations. If you take your political organizations, you have your leader, your deputy leader, your chairman. Mm -hmm. All these persons help push, uh, they fuel the narrative for vision and execute those particular things to get to a particular objective. Right. And like you said, if we're fighting with one arm, mm -hmm. you know you know what I said? And I said this uh, maybe a couple of months ago, and I, you know, I stand by it. I believe that everyone has an agenda. I think that political organizations have their agenda. The FNM has their agenda, the PLP has an agenda, and I just don't know if the Bahamian people have an idea of a course that we should travel. Well, and that's the that would be the that would be the absolute crystallization of of if we saw some movement in this space. If along the next election term, instead of candidates coming forward with a long list of here's the things I'm going to do, that the citizen, the electorate would come forward with a list of here's the things I want you to do. This is what you need to do. And 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 when we think about it, governments all governments have the potential of changing. Here, they've changed very frequently, every five years. The issues we're trying to address don't go away in five years, typically. We're not fixing elections, I mean, uh, education in five years. We're not fixing the economy for no. good in five years. No. There's all these things that need to exist. But the one sustainable thing that exists, no matter what administration, is our communities, our people. So leveraging and growing the power and the talents and the thoughts and the ideas that are inherent in those communities, regardless if they're high on the socioeconomic scale or lower, uh, is crucial because those folks know, hey, that's that that education program, that 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 you know, feeding in the in the schools, that's great. No matter who you are, keep that. I like this. Um, that that the work on you know our our communities continue to flood. Who's going to solve that thing? You say you're going to solve it. You say you're going to solve it. What are the solutions? We need to see that on paper. We need to not just hear that it, it's on a paper. We need to see what that really means. Are we going to invest in changing our building codes? Are we going to change, invest in, in drainage systems? Are we going to invest? So Adelaide and Yamacraw and Pine, Pinewood and the communities in, in Grand Bahama and, and other spaces that, that suffer this all the time, it shouldn't be that they just have to 
everything we're gonna own has to be three has foot up the floor, been, right? That that can't be that can't be the best solution. Has there ever? Because I asked Stefan and Vanessa the same thing. Has there ever been a time where within yourself and your and your quiet space you feel overwhelmed? You feel in a position where you're pushing out. It's a non-governmental organization. You articulate. You're insightful. You're in good position. You could find yourself in a corporate entity. And a, and a business making millions and millions of dollars right now. I'm putting it on you right now. <laughs> right? <laughs> we, we, we're we a not-for-profit, so, and, no, I'm, no, and I've been I'm not-for-profit saying. my whole life. So, no. yeah, so I, 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 I understand and live that very much. So, yeah. so have you have you found yourself, what is the fuel that keeps you going? Because I know that right. even listening to you, uh, I feel exhausted because if you've been doing all of these things, <laughs> and I said, my God, these people wouldn't listen, man, Matt, what we can do, right? So, so... Uh, what is that fuel that keeps you going, that keeps that, that uh, fire alive, burning in you to be able to ensure that one day uh, we could be able to, like you say, crystallize this and right. get some movement? So uh, I, I was joking a little bit, but I've been in, I've, I've worked for not-for-profits my whole life. I'm now 54. I've been working for not-for-profit organizations for 33 years. Uh, the first 20 of those years, I worked with folks with developmental disabilities. Folks with autism, Down syndrome. This is heavy, which is major, about. major things. And the fact was, that's hard work. You have to start to see you somebody develop patients. Well, not only that, but you see micro gains, right? So if you're working with somebody and it takes them six months to learn to tie their shoe or learn to open your work, do a bank a bank transaction or or develop a job, you've got to look very specifically and see, oh, are they making progress? And that has always served me very well because it gives me two two important concepts. One, this is not my victory. This is the victory of those around us. This is helping others to leverage and engage their power. And two, that things often we look over the really important components. So when I think about the eight years that I've been here at Org and the work we've done, I'm tremendously proud of so many things. We have 35 different pieces of legislation that we've had influence on. We have thousands of folks we've gone through our programs. Um, we have incredible uh, results in terms of programs we've executed. We've had good partnerships. We're well wow. considered. All this, blah, blah, blah. The truth is what makes me most, most proud um, are two things. One, and by the way, we've gotten lots of browbeating from governments who think we're too easy on the other group and not as on, and all sides have said that, right? Everybody says you're unfair with us and uh, not on the other, or they think we're part of the other group, whatever that is. So I, we, we, get, we endure that. But on, on, a, on two things that happen, one is the incredible talent and enthusiasm of the team we have around us. These are young, smart, talented Bahamians who are not not stopping. They're not looking back. They're going forward ahead because they know that the future is going to get better and is getting better and they're in, in charge of it. And so as we grow those volunteers, as we grow those people in our communities, their work is what is, is incredibly inspiring to me. And the other thing is I cannot go anywhere, anywhere in any of these islands where somebody doesn't come up to me and say, what y'all are doing is great. Keep doing it. This is at the grocery, this is at the pharmacy, this is when you stopped at a government office and you're standing in line, this is when I'm, somebody yelled it to me when I was just driving down Shirley Street. And that means that people are listening and that means people are interested in what we're talking about and they're interested in change, they're interested in being part of that change. Org is not going to save the Bahamas, the Bahamians are gonna save the Bahamas. I like it. I love it. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm sitting here talking with none other than Matt. Matt Aubrey, listen, Matt, you have given me some insight just now. I look at you differently now. Because <laughs> I, I didn't know this kind of, you started off with being able to help. Was it autistic kids? Uh, it was a whole range. It was fo folks who were coming out of the institution. So it was, they hadn't even been, had diagnosis for some of the, what these folks were dealing with. I look at you different. And I also look at the country different mm. in your position. Thank you. Guys, we're going to take this quick commercial break. Get right back after this. The Foundation. The Foundation with Howard Grant will be back right after this. The Foundation. 
It's Whopper Wednesday every Wednesday at Burger King Nassau. Make your Wednesday sizzle and sink your teeth into a flame-grilled beef patty topped with tomatoes, fresh-cut lettuce, mayo, pickles, ketchup, and sliced onions all on a toasted sesame seed bun with fries for only $5.95. Including that, this Whopper Wednesday, grab a friend and head down to your favorite BK Nassau location for a flame-grilled Whopper made your way with crisp fries for only $5.95. Burger King Nassau, where taste is king. Are you tired of the same old 5K runs? Want something more? Then get ready for the Chick Charney Challenge City Run on September 28th, starting at Crypto Wild. Test your strength, stamina, and spirit. It takes all of you to dodge, climb, conquer obstacles as you race through the heart of the city. Lace up and get to the Chick Charney Challenge City Run. Register now on our website, chickcharneychurn.com, or on our social media pages. Brought to you by Kalina, Island Yogurt, Advantage Insurance, Art of Graphics, Crypto Wild, and Guardian Radio 96.9. Great news! Ron's Electric Motors' new location on Cowpen Road, right next to Island Luck, is open Saturdays and Sundays. So for those needing repairs on electric motors, generators, welding machines, water pumps, battery charges, electric lifts, transformers, and power tools, Ron's Cowpen Road location can have you up and running on weekends. Don't forget, you can still visit Ron's Electric Motors on Wolf Road and Claridge Road, and now Ron's new location on Cowpen Road. Dial 356 356- 0249 or 323-5267. This is Guardian Radio 96.9 FM. Fresh news, smart talk, all day. The foundation. back ladies and gentlemen 96.9 fm radio howard brown your company the lines are wide open if you want to be able to join in ask matt one or two of these questions i'd love you to do so 323-6232-325-4316-325-4316-325-4259 anywhere for the family of islands 242-300-5720 or hit me up 422 422- Four seven nine six. Matt, I want to read some of these things. And people say, Howard, make sure you ask Mr. Arby this. Yeah, uh, so it says ORG indicated that they advocated for Freedom of Information mm-hmm. Act uh, eight years ago. Has ORG legally challenged the implementation or enforcement of existing laws in those eight years if they believe they are unconstitutional or violate other legal principles? And then they ask. They go on and ask, is have they? Petition the court to have this matter heard at any time. Is it legal? Is legal funding an issue? Uh, Illegal I'll, funding an issue. Right. I'll start with the last question first. As a not-for-profit, legal funding is absolutely always going to be an issue. Yeah. Um, it is a costly endeavor. But I also want to go back and, and put a perspective on the type of organization that we are and what we're looking at. So freedom of information, when it's implemented, we, we usually do a lot of research and look at sources, not just internationally, but regionally on, on what do these things look like when we're developing and putting forward our recommendations on the bills, but also in the process of enactment. Freedom of information is a process that does not just happen with the flip of a switch. Usually in countries, it takes on average uh, three to five years is what we've seen. Well, now here we are at seven years and it is stretching on. But the process that that can, can still be put forward that is unfortunately still legal is that governments can enact portions of a, of a law as, as it develops. So what we've seen here in, in the Bahamas is that there were portions that were enacted. The first was the repeal of the last law, and the second was that there could be a hiring of an information commissioner. They did hire a commissioner in the last administration in the form of retired Justice Keith Thompson, and they gave some resources so that he brought on a very talented deputy uh, in Shane Miller and uh, a number of a number of staff. 
Um, they worked very diligently. We worked collaboratively with them over the last year because that's our, our model is, is working across sectors. And they put together um, some resources. They put together some regulations which still need to be passed. Uh, they put those forward for consideration to government. And they also identified that there was a, necess there was a necessary amount of funding that was required in order to provide the, not only the internal uh, technology so that information could be tracked when these requests went forward, training that could happen in all the different 10 agencies that have been identified where this would start, and ultimately then the public education that needs to happen. And their budget didn't change from the 140,000 they had the first year, which they said was not very sufficient. This year, it became the same amount. So what we've continued to do is push and advocate. And we, as one group, have, have been effective, I think, in pushing and keeping this, this, uh, this concept and this important issue in, in the news. The media has been very uh, benef have been very positive in terms of making sure that they're also pushing this. But the truth is we also need to leverage and engage citizens to make sure that those people who are in the decision-making seats right now in government cannot make statements like this is not a priority. If, it, if you think it's a priority as a citizen, then we need to come together and work collaboratively. So folks can check us out at orgbahamas.com. You can follow us on Facebook at Org Bahamas Foundation or Instagram or LinkedIn. Um, you can join us and get our newsletter. You can give us your thoughts and your ideas about how you want to work with us. Um, Freedom of Information is a campaign that we're going to be uh, working towards in the next number of months, and we're going to—you're going to see a lot of that information and a lot of that push coming forward. But the the truth is, if if one group is the is the linchpin, uh, the law can be changed or 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 modified. If the community and the constituency and the electorate are the ones that says, "Hey, this is a priority," that means that's going to stay and stick. Mm -hmm. I want to be able to ask you a question as I look at this and listening to you. Um, this pops out. Uh, now, I, I want to see if we could disassociate the idea of the prime minister being able to say this because it, though he has mouthed and articulated most recently, this is a sentiment that existed for over two, maybe even three decades mm -hmm. now. This sort of an idea that as we utter it out into the public, as we being able to release that, that the mindset of the populace should being able to take on what I say. And after I say this, this is the direction that mm -hmm. we're going, right? Uh, sort of an emperor complex or whatnot. I don't know whether or not it's egotistical. I don't know whether or not it's a cultural thing that is embedded in politics. But for the prime minister to say, and we have, we've seen this over the course of this administration. Mm -hmm. We've seen this over the course of this administration. The prime minister today, campaign finance reform law, not a priority, right? We've seen it most recently with the chairman of the, free, uh, the PLP being able to take on this sort of a position that says uh, the PLP has a philosophical difference between them and the FNM as it relates to freedom of information, right? We've seen the free national movement come out and the person of Michael Pintard decide to talk about the modifications that needs to happen from a banking perspective, but we haven't had social pushback or socially taken on this position to say that these needs to be addressed. So talk to me about whether or not, what is this element, let me ask it like that, what is this element that uh, propels men in their particular capacity that sit in this seat based upon the past 20 years, very temporary, that sit in this seat to make them believe that, okay, I can say this and there's an expectation that things should move in the direction I say. I, I want to say that part of what you say maybe leads to the conclusion that maybe it shouldn't be a man in that seat, but we can have that oh conversation somewhere else. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> we can, go, I like that, we go can take that somewhere else. Um, I, I am. We are not surprised at org mm -hmm. that uh, of some of this, these comments because, with all honesty, what this administration maybe is saying a little bit more overtly um, was was present in the last administration. Right. Yes. It, it, you know, these things are in manifestos. They might be stated. We saw the tabling of uh, the Integrity Commission bill happen in 2017, never debated. We saw the tabling of an ombudsman bill, never debated. Um, we did see this government just passed an ombudsman bill, but no funding. It hasn't been put in force. There's, you know, these these things are 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 put in a certain level of balance where. Um, and again, maybe government's priorities are not that because of what they're contending with or what they see as important, or if they interpret that, in fact, these things don't change day-to-day -day lives. But I think what we need to also do is, is, is reevaluate that and get back to the point that the individual voice, the voice of the community, the voice of the constituency, they do matter, and they have critical, 
critical, critical needs. So when we did Freedom of Information and we worked with a collaborative of about 22 different not-for-profit and for-profit associations and groups like the Chamber and uh, Save the Bays and Bahamas uh, uh, Bar Association and all those good, good groups, um, we did a letter writing campaign and I think maybe the most any constituency got was maybe like 80 letters. Well, don't you know, that was part of a conversation that was had in the House of Assembly where they <laughs> held it up and said, I got 80 letters and there's no way 80 people sent me these. Like 80 was enough to move a conversation where they got, it caught their attention. So, mm. so thinking about that power that's just lying around right now for folks to be able to leverage by collectively putting forward their voice. So when they we don't talk, even know it exists. Right. So we want to talk about freedom of information or if you want to talk about the importance of having mechanisms like uh, like the an integrity or anti-corruption bill or having an ombudsman, which is supposed to help anytime you're running into that challenge with government where you suspect maybe things haven't been given to me in the fairest of way or the full development of a procurement act where you not only see what that what the opportunities are you see where they are but you're not in, you're seeing it within the state owned enterprises where we spend millions and millions of dollars these things are very important things to make happen because they will make a difference in people's day-to-day -day lives it will make the difference between having an opportunity to just exist and then an exist an opportunity to thrive and that's what we're looking for do uh, somebody text me right now? They asked me to say, uh, do they have a WhatsApp group uh, for ORG? Uh, I have been, I will say, I'm the one person that's been resistant to having a WhatsApp group, um, but it is probably in, the, in, in the works. Here. I'm just saying. But um, they can always contact us at info at orgbahamas.com or uh, they can give us a call um, uh, at, at 477-3134. Uh, or they can join us and make sure that we, we'll, we'll get information to them as everything comes out. So there should be a lot of opportunities for folks to be able to connect with us. Uh, and, and if not, they can always get us through you. I know that. No, definitely. I'm here and I'm available, guys. You can be able to always hit me at 827-0111, and I'll be more than happy to transfer that information to all the persons I'm connected to over at ORG. Uh, somebody says this, analysis, nobody was voting for minutes by elections happen. By elections have historically had low voter turnouts. I, I I agree. I think by elections and things that are somewhat atypical um, tend not to to do that. But at the same time, I think when looked at in combination with what happened in the last election and and whether people wanted to vote for minutes or didn't want to vote for minutes, there was less folks that were voting. Point blank. And that that's the indicator it, for whatever reason. And I'm not ascribing blame or, or fault, but that means that in going into this next election, we have to be real specific at how do we gain back that traction? How do we give people a sense in a time when we know public trust is low, in a time when people may be feeling disenfranchised, when people may be feeling, hey, things are not going the way that I want and I don't feel like my voice is really going to matter. I may not like who I see in front of me as a traditional one party candidate from one side or the other. I might be more inclined to another candidate. All of those things are important. But the option of retracting, not doing your part, not getting involved has a lot of implications that can support things going the same way they've been going versus making some differences for positive and sustainable change. One of the things that I've gathered from this conversation is that uh, even on air or off air, uh, that there is tremendous amount of talents that is not necessarily tapped into, acknowledged in our society, and that there are a great deal of young persons who are eager uh, to kind of participate, but have never been acknowledged to be able to give an opportunity. And uh, you and your capacity of being able to see those over the years and open the doors and really been able to give formality, been able to give education, information, and really started that, that, that movement towards those things. What needs to happen with ORG, right? And what can we do here uh, from a media standpoint to be able to work with you so we can be able to realize this as a community? I will say this, and it sounds like I'm I'm uh, I'm just saying it to be nice. But Guardian Radio has been a really, really good friend of ours. We've we've given you've given a lot of opportunity, and and uh, for folks who maybe didn't know about us to better understand us, and particularly on the talk radio opportunities, we can explain a little bit these more complex yeah. issues as well as well as what we're doing. So, so um, that's one thing is is continuing that partnership and 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 creating because media has a big space in in terms of op open and good governance. Um, but the other, I think, becomes people finding out the basics, finding out, following us, get involved, join. Um, if you have the means, we're a not-for-profit. We'll always take your, your donation and, and use it to great effect. We're very good at doing 
a lot with a very little. We have five members on our team, and we're working on a lot of different projects. But the other is, is actually our fourth area of work, and it's one of the things I'm most excited about right now. Um, if, if you follow the pattern that we, we look at bills and laws and then we try and give citizens a chance to develop their skills of advocacy and, and citizen involvement, and then we create tools and spaces where people can get involved, we also want to make sure that there are organizations and spaces where they can get involved. So we've devoted a lot of energy and time to helping to build the not-for-profit sector and now coming in forward the faith-based sector for those organizations to also be more sustainable places where people that want to get involved can do so if they have a particular interest in, an, in a community or about the environment or about gender support or child development, things that maybe org isn't working on. And what we see is that when that happens, when people are involved with groups that they see a, an impact that's, that's directly in their community, they're also much more likely to pay attention to things like good governance and elections and anti-corruption and those things. If I'm struggling and I don't know where my next meal is, then freedom of information is not that my most me. important issue, right? No, I can eat the paper. Right, right, exactly. <laughs> so we do a lot of training. Uh, we've trained at this point, we're in the midst of training about 160 not-for-profit organizations. We just had a great retreat with one of Luthra where not-for-profit groups are coming together. So get informed and get involved is absolutely like the solution. And we, and we will keep doing our work to make sure those opportunities are there and keep coming on as long as you'll have us here, Howard. Oh, definitely. Well, I'm going to take this last break out here. Um, when we get back, I want to talk to you about a couple of things. There's a text I want to read. But when we get back, I want to know about uh, some of the long-term projection. Where do you see uh, ORG in the next five years? What needs to happen to get to those particular positions? When we get back, guys, I want you to join me in conversation. you got one more time. If you want to be able to get in here, please do so. 323-6232-325-4316-325-4259. Anywhere from the Family of Islands, 242-300-5720. Or you can hit me up, 422-4796. Quick break. Be right back after this. The Foundation will be back right after this. Do you have uncontrollable debt? Are you ready to make that move to Fidelity for a stress-free future? These loans have a built-in savings plan that pays you unbeatable interest. Ask about our debt consolidation loans today. Call 356-7764. Fidelity we're good for you. Attention pizza lovers! Markle's is getting bigger and better! We're offering a deal that can't be missed! Head in and order a mouth-watering large one-topping pizza for just $10! You heard right, just $10! This offer is only available at our Southwest, Burnett Road, Robinson Road, and Prince Charles locations. Call in or order online and pick up in restaurant today. This amazing carryout offer is available for a limited time only. The Grand Bahama News is available every Tuesday in the Nassau Guardian. You can buy your local paper at Freeport Convenience Stores, Western Bakery, DeGregory's Fine Foods, and Bellevue Gifts. Now is the time to reach your Grand Bahama market with affordable packages, including print and digital. Call GB News Sales Representative Kavandre at 822-6717 or message him on WhatsApp for ad rates. Classified ads are now available every Tuesday as well. Keep up with everything Grand Bahamian every Tuesday in the Nassau Guardian. This is Guardian Radio 96.9 FM. Fresh news, smart talk, all day. Foundation. The 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 foundation. And we are back, ladies and gentlemen, 96.9 FM Radio. Howard Grant in your company, the foundation, wrapping this show up. 
uh, I had a great time, and I'm sitting with none other than Matt Aubrey being able to talk to us from Organization for Responsible Governance, talking about what needs to happen going forward. Now, you can see the trend. You can see the trajectory. You can see the path, the course that we've taken here on the foundation to be able to talk about Stay Sober Bahamas. That's what we did for one week, solid. We've in interviewed... Uh, independent persons we had org in the mix being able to have a very good conversation i got great feedback from that and also the next week right after we had a conversations about the integrity right uh the integrity of uh in politics right so we took it three tiers we looked at people we looked at politicians we looked at, mm -hmm. we've identified those things we've dissected those things we had good conversations i had other persons mm -hmm. being able to speak about it and get back here, we decided to be able to take the entire month of October. I said this to you. We took the entire month of October. We will take the entire month of October uh, from October 1st all the way to November 1st and being able to dissect each one of the constituencies. Now, this ain't got nothing to do with individuals. Right. Individuals sit in these various seats, but we want to be able to dissect each one of the, the constituencies. We're asking general questions, and through the course of these things, mm -hmm. I want to be able to amplify that with some of the things that you guys have been able to do. But I'd like you to join me. On at least on one of these uh, mm -hmm. one of these days, even if you give a general synopsis of these particular things that that should happen throughout the course of the month. Absolutely, and and I think it, it's a great crystallization of some of the things we talked about. Right, that that's the beginning of going back to the gym. Yeah, we're we're asking you'll ask folks in the community to start to talk about some of the issues that they have and some of the solutions that they might have, and all of a sudden that gives them in the practice of coming forward. I think it's too easy to make a quick judgment on, well, this person is good, this person is bad, the government doesn't do anything. It starts with what can you articulate in your own circumstance that needs to change and that what you're willing to contribute to. I like so that. I think what, what, you're, what you're proposing makes a lot of sense. Okay. So tell me this now, uh, as we wrap up, tell me about uh, ORG over the next few years, about goals that you've placed that you've put before there about the incremental steps that you're taking with patients to ensure that you can be able to see that kind of a change that you're pushing for. What are some of the things that you'd like to see? I know that you've talked ad nauseum about uh, the NDP National Development mm -hmm. Plan. I know that you continue to be able to agitate for that, but let me know from your own non-government standpoint, what are some of the things that you're working on over the next few years that you'd like to be able to see come to pass? Uh, thank you so much. And, and it's an exciting time because we've just come out of a number of different projects that have helped to kind of give us a, a sense of what's going forward. We've developed a strategic plan and we're about to finalize all the components of that. In the next number of years, we see a few things in terms of moving the needles. And first and foremost, you've heard me talk about it, is citizen engagement and capacity building for our citizens. Um, we're going to be working on a couple of different projects over this uh, coming year, which will help people to better understand some of the systems of governance, some of the information that government is generating to be able to be more critical at looking at that. We're obviously going to keep talking and pushing this whole concept of voting, um, an expansion of our voters' toolkit and being able to to uh, build that. We're going to do more uh, looking and listening to our communities in the family islands. Uh, we have a pretty extensive travel schedule that we're looking to set up to make sure that all of our opportunities where we're going in and we're sitting and not just telling people things, but more importantly, sitting and listening to them. Uh, and then bringing that information to a place where we're going to help to we're going to be working to help folks to be better advocates as groups, whether it be civil society groups, business groups, uh, faith-based organizations, um, and in the in the not-for-profit side of things, which is really exciting, is we're going to be taking on an exercise over the next year to develop out a list and a map of all those not-for-profits that out there. They're out there. It's likely that there's maybe 11 to 1,200 registered not-for-profits, maybe more. A lot of those can also be churches, and so we need to better understand who's out there so that we can, as a sector, be more effective and more, more uh, have more impact in the communities, being able for individuals and citizens to be able to say, oh, this is the group I can work with, or this is how we can work through those things. So looking at good governance is not just about government. It's about how all of us do what we do in a better and more effective and sustainable way. That's what our commitment's going to be do the next you think, couple of years. Do you think that you have against that kind of a proverbial Berlin wall, that wall that separates you from how people perceive you, how people view you? Do you think you chipped away at it enough where you can be able to enter the community and persons are asking, are saying, oh, yeah, this ORG, we trust these guys. Talk to me. I think there's work always that has to be done with that. Um, I think last year we did a lot to make that gains. Um, folks might have read some things we're putting out in the newspaper most recently that's kind of the story of org, giving you a little bit behind the scenes of who are we and what are we doing. So more of that information is going to be shared. 
Uh, hopefully, if you've been following us, you've seen the work that's happening in the community, and you see the, the power and the personality of some of those folks that are doing that, whether it be Stefan or Ariana or Vanessa um, and or myself. And so hopefully the, pr the work will prove out, but we're also trying to be a little bit more specific about folks knowing who we are, where we're coming from, how we get funded, what our, what our programs are, and where they can get involved. Mm -hmm. um, let me know this, because um, I'm sitting here thinking about some things. We've, I had a conversation with uh, Ambassador Devin Rule. Mm -hmm. He has a, a back, he's a theologian, a pastor, mm -hmm. right? But he has a background in uh, political science, mm -hmm. right? Like he, he's really good at this stuff. And so as he started to talk with, on the show and being able to talk about these things, the first thing I asked him is, why don't you teach? <laughs> yes. And so I want to ask you this question. Mm -hmm. Um, if there are persons who are eager to get into the community to have this kind of a conversation about how to advocate, uh, how do you become an a, a independent candidate, mm -hmm. and what does that entail, so forth and so on, and they want to have a, a workshop of sorts, are you open to be able to kind of facilitate one of those days? Absolutely, and, and we've done so in past. Um, I will make the one, the one uh, point, this has been my experience in my life, is that you don't have to be elected to make a difference. Exactly. And we want to reinforce that because sometimes I think there's an important pathway in terms of you know, going forward to being a formal elected uh, leader. But the truth is, as not-for-profit, as somebody working with a faith-based organization, as somebody who is in academia, as somebody as a media leader, you can have a significant impact in the development of this country. You can show and, and demonstrate to others that it's not just, we don't have to just fight with one arm. And we need those leaders in those other spaces. And they need, we need to be valued, they need to be supported, they need to be remunerated, but they also need to be uh, reinforced that, that that brings just as much uh, value sometimes as having you know your MP sit in your in your event, it's like knowing that there are folks who've been trained to be advocates and be community activists and are trained in that process is can be very very important. And we do that training. We have an advocacy toolkit that folks can check out on our website for free, uh, orgbahamas.com. There's lots of other resources that are that are available for you as well. Um, so yeah, we would be very interested in in helping folks to to facilitate that kind of workshop and also offer any resources we have which are available. I love this. All right, so all you guys are out there who are a part of a church, which is an NGO, a part of these particular things, I know that you want to be able to always incorporate this sort of an idea from a biblical standpoint, but there are rules and regulations that you render to Caesar that is Caesar's. Uh, the rules and regulations of this land indicate that we should move in a particular manner. You should employ, engage, and reach out to ORG to ensure that you can be able to talk to those persons in your congregation and help them to understand how they can participate with the reform, reformation, rejuvenation of our community. This has been a wonderful conversation, my brother. I Thank truly you, enjoyed this. Thank I you. truly enjoyed this, guys. ORGBahamas.com. ORGBahamas.com. What's your number? 477-3134. Uh, 4773134. Matt Aubrey, he'd be more than happy to assist you. This is The Foundation with Howard Grant, 96.9 FM radio. Great conversation. Great to be in your presence, having good conversation. Guys, I'm going to see you tomorrow right here on Small Business Thursday. If you want to be able to get into that and see exactly what's what, hit me up, 827-0111. See you tomorrow. Godspare.